Well, it's good evening here at seven o'clock in uh, Queensland, um, which obviously is New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, and ACT now that they're all joined us on the same time zone. It's nine o'clock for our friends over there in New Zealand, and of course, it's 10 o'clock in the morning in the UK. Uh, and tonight, um, our guest is actually in the studio, which is uh, all right, and um, a fascinating story. And um, my co host and colleague here, uh, Julia, actually uh, met him in a in an eventful space and place here in Brisbane, and as a result, he's in the studio. So, so welcome to you, Julia. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode of Dreaming the New Dream. It's great to have you with us, and I'm so delighted to have Adrian join us. I did meet Adrian on an eventful <laughs> space on the dance floor, and as the evening went 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 along, people got happier and happier. <laughs> We're ripping off their shirts, jumping up and down, and we all had great fun. But it's a, it's um, I was um, I went a couple of times because I had such a good time and such a. I just felt so connected with the people that we're dancing with because obviously when you dance, uh, dance in that kind of space, you are not following fixed patterns or routines. You are tuning into your body and giving it freedom of expression, which we don't very often get these days. And as time went on and I got to know Adrian and his beautiful wife, Monica, I was completely gobsmacked to find out that Adrian is not just a dancer, but a fully fledged engineer who has worked all the way in the White House and um, in high echelons of power. And he has uh, lived in California. And for some reason, the rainbow serpent brought him to Australia. And then on top of that, to make it even, even more interesting, he was born in Transylvania, and he's the first Transylvanian I've ever met. So welcome, Adrian. We've got lots to talk and ask you about. Oh, thank you, Julia, for such an introduction. Yeah, I don't know what to say. It's like, um, it's been like a really a pleasure to meet you, and it was such a like synchronous moment to just when you came to one of our events. It was actually uh, an event that was done for the community, and I got to catch up with you a little bit and talk about the interesting things you do. And I so appreciate you inviting me here. And because this is, I think, um, yeah, it's the first time when I do this kind of an interview. And um, uh, I felt that, uh, yeah, this is uh, something that you you passion, you passion have passion about. And and uh, just we can join forces here and, uh, and bring something different to the world. So thank you. Absolutely. And um... Jeff's got the map up here of uh, presumably Transylvania, it looks like Romania. And um, from what I learned from you talking to you is that you are actually the third generation dancer in your family. And uh, that dance has a, plays a hugely important role in your society growing up to the point that when you move countries and you don't dance every weekend, you actually miss it. Yes, that's right. Uh, I mean, third generation that I know of, uh, like uh, even my great grandfather, I think was not really as big of a dancer. But yeah, my grandfather was uh, was part of uh, this group called Kalushari, which is um, uh, a ritual dance, mystical ritual dance that has its roots back to the Etrusk culture and was first documented by the second emperor of Rome. Numa Pompilius. Uh, at that time, it was the cult of Mars, um, and uh, they were called the Sali. The Sali were the dancing monks or the dancing priests of Mars. That they were uh, during the springtime. They were um, joining the people in the street um, to do this uh, dance that was for the purpose of protecting and healing. Uh, the city. So they had this belief that um, uh, the Mars, uh, the shields of Mars, which they were these anchilas that uh, I, I brought like one of these uh, pictures that date back from the, that time, uh, these colleagues started doing this uh, dance uh, with, initially they were doing them with shields, with these shields that they believed that they came from heaven to protect them and uh, with swords. Uh, and um, this was uh, like a symbolic thing that uh, like at that time um, was like considered that as long as they carry those shields and they, they carry this energy, the city of Rome would be protected. So from there and all the way to nowadays, uh, these, the Kalushari um, 
um, form of dance. It's preserved in Romania um, because Romania, it's like a very odd mix of modern and traditional. Uh, we are exactly at the boundary between East and West. Um, we are exactly at the border now at NATO and Russia. Um, and this is where like you have like both Eastern traditions uh, and uh, things that have to do with inner like work and with uh, um, peace and, and harmony and the Western world, which is more externally oriented with engineering and, and um, you know, capitalism and everything that uh, like Western Europe has to offer. So Romania and Transylvania especially is like really the like intersection of these both worlds. And we have, I was lucky to be able to still see these traditions alive because Romania was exposed really late to the Industrial Revolution, it didn't happen in the 19th century. Romanian uh, um, Industrial Revolution happened like around 1945, 1950, uh, when um, pretty much after the Second World War. And uh, that allowed like just to have still contact with this rural traditional kind of culture that was um, was so different than what in, in western society what we are used to i mean already i'm of course I, I live in in the western society for more than 22 years i left when i was 25 right after graduating uni and um, for me i think the first thing that kind of uh, struck me it was like you said i missed these weekly ways to reconnect to to come back into my body to um, meditate now we call it meditation before probably it was called just uh, you know a walk in nature or gardening or or listening to music or dancing uh, of course, there, and all these things and meditation that are just an essential part of us being balanced and, and catching up and processing all the experiences that we go through that can keep keeps us sane. And um, I felt that in the West, um, there is very quickly we resort to like just going to a quick fix, to a medicine, to a pill that will solve the problems. Uh, and they kind of solve the symptoms, but really the the core of it, the, the problem is, is, I don't think it's gone. And uh, this is what these dances that my grandfather was addressing. It was actually a dance designed to help people that are into some kind of physical or psychological distress. And they kind of drift in a world of their own uh, into like probably something what modernly we would call like a PTSD kind of thing. Like when you get disconnected from the environment, when you, when you are um, in, um, how to say... Um, in a state of psychosis, kind of like disconnected psychosis, disassociative. disassociative. And uh, those dances were really the things that uh, would help people to connect back into their body, to come back from that uh, hazy world of like fake memories and and traumatic visions of probably something that happened before to them once, and then all of a sudden they they couldn't function properly, and. Uh, this tradition was like <clears throat> it was very interesting how it came up um it was uh, so it, they start usually in march so this is because it was the god of mars like it was uh, it, it was starting in march but they would just start to be recruited um and this is usually young uh, men chosen for their promise and they were single men uh that they had both parents alive so, in other words, people that were not traumatized in a way or another. <clears throat> and uh, these guys were taken by the captain of this, uh, that was the initiated, into a secluded way, in, uh, sec secluded place in the forest to be initiated right. into this uh, rite. Uh, so they could actually be able to perform this dance and, and have this gift of taking people's... Um, they, at that time they were calling it bad spirits so they were protecting against these spirits that would bother them and uh, and bring them back to their community to the people that they, they loved so it's quite shamanic was it you know, like you, you had to be chosen you had to go through a ritual you had to train for it 
Yes. And there was the healing purpose and the uniting purpose and, you know, bringing everything back in order, which is what the Shalom Sijri do in each community. Yes, that's correct. I, I mean, for me, it was also later on, I just realized what it was. And it, I just realized only when I was in the United States and uh, witnessing the right rituals in the Native American traditions. And I couldn't help but notice the similarities, even there are different ways. But all of all these shamanic methods, they kind of like they serve the same purpose. And that is really to bring that to, to help people process all their uh, memories and all their experiences, make sense out of them and come back into a, a place of harmony with the environment, with the people around them. Um, and uh, I was really, when I realized that, I was just ecstatic just to, to realize that, you know, this was this is what I was doing all along. Um, but uh, kind of like just you no know, seeing through it from the outside, from like another culture to realize what it was, because I took it for granted. It was something that we were doing all the time. It's um, this tradition of dances. It was like something that in the village and in the traditional cultures is done every week. So every weekend they had this hora or this circle dance that is present in a form or another in every culture. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, during this horror, that this is where, like, in the city, we were like taking it in a different form. Like for me, I just took it, and I, I would once I started, I had a computer back in '95, and I built my own computer, and I started to collect more music. I started to um, get friends together, and we were just dancing in the weekend. So the ecstatic dance that I was doing, it was. Yeah, back in like 95, 96, that's when I started to do it. Uh, but it was just because we were enjoying it and we didn't never needed any kind of stimulant. We didn't drink alcohol or any anything else. We're in the, at the same time, we were in a yoga school. Can I just, sorry, yeah. just stop from the iPad? Sure. I was going to ask you about this picture. So this is what you're saying, the cer Ceruliate dances? Yeah, these are the Kalushari or uh, Kolisali. Uh, so we call it Kalushari. So it's like really our languages are very Latin and Romanian is very close. And uh, they, some people, they call it also, they say because they jump so high, they are because they are connected with the spirits of the, fa the fairies, the spirits of the forest. So they float kind of in the air. Um, yeah, that's, uh, and this is their joy and their like liveliness is the one that can actually take a person, doesn't matter how disconnected they are, they can come back to, to their senses. Okay, so that's the, you know, the high and the ecstasy, which yeah. pulls them out of the lower vibration. Yes, yes. That's, uh... Have you done this? Because I was going to ask you, because like, <laughs> I can jump upwards. But then the idea of doing the splits at the same time, <laughs> it just kind of goes, my mind just goes, how am I going to do that? <laughs> So well, I'm ask you, Adrian, how do we do that? Well, I when I was uh, like just probably like in my twenties, yeah, I mm. could just jump a little bit higher, yeah, and yeah. <laughs> I could do probably the same thing. So and... you wait until you're like starting to come down, and then you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, it's uh, well the form. It's like again very different. Uh, my my grandfather used to yeah, do it, and at the same time while he was doing it, he was also whistling mm. to to coordinate with uh, the people in the in the same group. Mm. Uh, so he was uh, really just the bearer of this tradition uh, from from like that he took it again from another captain of of, uh, of dance uh, of, the, of this dance and he kept um, you know he kept it alive. Uh, but again, he was born at, in the village, but he was actually a very educated man. He but and he lived all his life in the city, probably after 20, 20 years old. Um, uh, and the, so he kept both these parts of himself, this uh, like the part that he had to show up for work and be like the financial chief officer of a big factory uh, or a teacher at later on in life uh, and have this traditional part uh, that, uh, you know, keeping all these traditions from like who knows thousands of years old. Uh, and uh, probably that's why I, I felt I feel for me it's also like something that um, feels natural. I'm at the same time an engineer, and I do lots of things on the in the mainstream world. But at the same time, I feel that I need that part, that that connection with nature, the connection with uh, uh, the traditions that help. It, there are nothing else but ways for us to to reconnect. Uh, I tell you what, you guys are Romanian. You got a, a great stable of. Um... Well, pedigree of uh, Janess. I mean, Nadia Comanich. I mean, she was just 
unbelievable, <laughs> isn't it? So that flexibility and, and um, the tea offered and all the rest of the Romanian gymnasts, I mean, you can see where the dancing has uh, overflowed between gymnasts and really dancing, isn't it? There's quite a, a shared um, relationship there. Yeah, I guess because, as I said, it's a big tradition, like everybody is dancing. It's uh, it, when kids are taught to dance since they are like five or six, it's like really they uh, the parents, they they take it as a big responsibility for to prepare them when they go first to the that hora dance, to the uh, community dance, that they actually know, like they can let themselves be and let themselves dance. Uh, so maybe, yeah, that has an effect on on all the other physical activities that, uh, like gymnastics and uh, other uh, things that... Um... Oh, the other one's weight training, isn't it? Yeah. Weightlifting, you guys are good at weightlifting. Yeah. yeah. Um, we moving um, to the United States as a continent from um, Romania, we're going into this... Yeah, actually, sorry, uh, yeah, before we do that, there's two questions I had was, how did, from these right, rites of mass in Rome, how did this... Oh, how did they? How did they come to Romania? Uh, so Romania, the southern part of Romania, was uh, at one point uh, colonized by the Romans. So we oh. still have like, uh, uh, like uh, different uh, buildings and different, uh, like even aqueducts and things that were from the Roman era. Uh, Dobroja, which is like by the Black Sea and all the, like on the shore of Danube, there are lots of. Um, uh, Roman artifacts, uh, and I guess there was uh, like there was an overlap. Also, as I said, language-wise, Romanian is very similar with Latin. In uh, third grade, we just learned Latin in like one semester because we just learned the differences between uh, like because it's so similar. Um, again, those shields that the Mars warriors were uh, were wearing in that uh, depiction of uh, Salis that were like the um, Mars dancing priests it's actually very similar with the tracian shield that was used um, in the in romania that this is way before even the roman empire so tracians are the same it's a that tribe i don't know if you saw like uh, um the gladiator uh with russell crowe uh he's actually from he who was called the, the the tracian he was coming from that tribe so romanians are coming from a from dacians which are it's an offshoot from tracians so this is, I think, uh, there was this connection. I think always there was uh, probably this right uh, in, into that population uh, that was speaking the same language. Uh, it was more officialized by, uh, by the, the second emperor of Rome, by Numa Pompilius, um, uh, because he wanted to, he's the one that actually created all the rules and rituals that the whole Roman Empire was based later on that allowed him to to sustain for so long. He created like a, lots of um, moral and like um, um, like worthy of following models. Uh, so they had like the Vestal Virgins um, uh, rituals also. So it was like the it was that feminine side that nurturing that that uh, the chastity, the purity, that uh, was a very, very important um, quality that they, they valued. And they were the ones that they were the bearer of the truth. So even if you wanted to have something like a will carried out or this, you would actually entrust it to the Vestals. Uh, and then the, the masculine part of this rite is the ritual of Mars, which, uh, uh, as I said, initially, it was like more about like physical warriors, about like swords and shields. And it was this shield that the Ancilla, that uh, the Emperor Numa or Pompilius uh, believed that fell from heaven. And uh, he said that he, uh, the, her, his, um, um, it was, um, she had, he had, um, what's, what's it called? Um, a nymph, a nymph, which is like a channel. It was like a, a lady that she was channeling. Uh, her, her name is, uh, it, Egeria, Egeria. So Egeria just channeled for him and he told him that actually that shield came to Rome to, to be a symbol of protection. And as long as that shield remain in the possession of Rome, the Rome is going to be protected. It's something similar with what uh, the Trojans have like in the form of Palladium. I don't know if you know, like the Palladium was like a wooden statue that was also a, an amulet or a symbol of protection. So he, then uh, what he did, he, just to protect the identity of this Anchila, this shield that came, came from heaven, he ordered to make 11 other more shields I, completely identical 
with that shield and put them to, into the Temple of Mars and appointed these uh, young men, uh, the, the Sali, the Kali Sali, to protect them and to uh, make sure that nobody touches them. And uh, this is really how, like, the first historical kind of, this is 700 BC. It's uh, kind of like the spiritual mandate that uh, the emperor had was that shield. Yeah. yeah. Well, the Sully, that was used in Game of Thrones, wasn't it? There was a huge big army that turned up over just using the same name. Oh, yeah, yeah the Game of Thrones, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think they take some, like, parts, different parts from history and uh, uh, they probably, like, just make the story. Exactly right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hey, um, your place was, um, oh, correct me if I'm wrong, I must pronounce it, Brasov? Brasov, yeah. Okay. So um, it's in the home of... Um, Transylvania, which is um, Victor Vlad or something, Vlad? Vlad, Vlad the Impaler, yeah, yeah. yeah he yeah. was, again, another figure in the Middle Ages, yeah. So, so that's where we are, and this is the capital of Transylvania, yeah? Well, it was, uh, yeah, uh, during the Habsburgic Empire, like, after the, my city was founded in, like, after the 1200s by the Teuton Knights, after they came from the Fifth Crusade. So the Teuton Knights is the same, similar with like the Templars and these, like they, they were like knights that they were protecting the virtues of religion. So they went, they went to Jerusalem to take Jerusalem back. They failed, they came back and they actually founded uh, my city uh, that actually had this year 750 years anniversary of the first um, uh, historical documentation of it. So uh, Brashov was uh, always a center of... Um, commerce it was like the, the crossroads uh, of carpathians so it was the passing over the carpathians from the wallachia and moldavia moldavia and wallachia are the other uh, romanian provinces to transylvania right yeah so what do you call those knights i um, hadn't heard that word before uh, the so they are uh, the templars you probably heard and okay. these are these are the um, uh, what are <laughs> just now it's escaping yeah, no, it's i think they're in poland as well I don't. I heard you the first time. Yeah, yeah. I can't remember. So. Yeah, so I never heard those, that word before. You know, it's, that's okay. So um, they all joined forces. Teuton, Teuton Knights. Yeah, Teuton Knights, yeah. Mm -hmm. Teuton. So it's, yeah. T U T O N. Yeah. That's the German one. Too. Yeah. Teutonic. Yeah, yeah, Teutonic. So they are Saxons because the whole city, it's actually Saxon. Like if you it look does. at the architecture and everything, uh, and it's uh, still, um, we have like a high school, like kindergarten schools and high school that teaches everything in German. Um, at one point, uh, my city was majority German, then Hungarian and then Romanian. Uh, and uh, my mother is also Hungarian, so I'm half Romanian, half Hungarian. Um, so it's a mixture of like nationalities and, uh, and cultures and traditions. And uh, lots of those were, it's I think the last corner of Europe where those traditions are still alive. Um, we have like even like I think the most the personality that kind of put light on this was Prince Charles because he just has like considers Transylvania his second home. He bought a house in the village where my um, uh, father-in-law was born, Viscri. And uh, he just loves to come there because he never he's never seen anywhere else in the world that he traveled a place where like true sustainability and resilience and uh, like because pretty much those people were able to self-sustained like they were producing everything uh, like the clothes the traditional clothes that uh, i'm dressed like in those with the pictures that i give you are actually made by my uh, my uh, my my wife's grandmother from scratch they were pretty much growing hemp and they were take making the string and then they would have like one of these um, um i don't know how they are called um, sewing like they were making the fabric and they, they did everything so all those are authentic they are just made from scratch no f industrial kind of processing or anything everything uh was done locally they didn't need basically anything from the outside just amazing that's really something worth aiming for now and there's a picture of you with a guitar yeah yeah this music was a big part of, like my father this is what i took from my father was playing guitar and harmonica and and since i was a kid i was just exposed to all the music like we had like a huge collection of lps from like all the symphonies classical music 
operas all the way to like some western music it was coming we had these big magnetoscopes because we didn't we are not allowed really to have music from the west it was still communism uh, so we would they would smuggle like the Beatles or you know ABBA or Bon Yem. and um, when I was about probably seven six seven years old he gifted me a magnetoscope which a Tesla magnetoscope and uh, that's when I started to build my collection of music uh, and uh, I loved like I didn't really understand English at the time I was listening to be the Beatles and I was melting I was just so impressed like by the by the music and um, and that kind of like always I was passionate about uh, that and that's why I was even when I I was in uh, in uni and I started to be able to afford to buy speakers and to have a computer that was the first thing I did I just gather my friends and let's dance because and we were all enjoying that time to you know just be ourselves I see in the European Union it's really Romania is really classified as um, a low socioeconomic country um, and it's got a, a bum rap with um, the Romneys uh, or the Gypsies going into the UK. Mm -hmm, yeah, yeah. That uh, unfortunately, like after the after nineteen eighty nine, Romania was um, at that time it was pretty much exporting a lot of things. Uh, uh, lots of things like even tractors that were they made it all the way to Australia I've actually met somebody that had one of those tractors UTB tractors um, so the the mistake that the ruler at that time Ceausescu did was to actually he wanted to detach from the international monetary fund and pay those debts ahead of time because he knew that if those debts would actually continue they would actually enslave the country and they would he wouldn't yeah. be able to get out of it but he's forced it too much and um, people like in the i remember just in the late 80s just before the revolution people were struggling so and that kind of created uh, led cia to to create a whole revolution that happened in 1989 in december uh, and uh, after that, pretty much the economy was downhill. There was uh, pretty much all the companies that came in um, purchased the factories that they were uh, in Romania. They were producing cars, tractors, I said, helicopters, airplanes in my town, and uh, they sold them to scrap metal. My father actually was in the last few years that he, where he, he was the director of total security man, total quality management in uh, one of these factories of 30,000 plus employees and he saw every everybody fired and like his uh, the the divisions that he designed that they were pretty much making brass uh, products which are pretty much they had orders for 10 years ahead where it was cut closed cut and and pretty much sent to scrap metal so yeah um, Romania was um, like most of the countries that they were colonized, uh, just uh, the victim of um, an economic coup and uh, yeah. never recovered. And after that corruption and all these things, uh, now it's starting to recover. And in some way, it's like the fastest growing economy in the western part of the country, especially. Uh, western part of Romania always was a bit more industrialized and Transylvania and uh, like the part that is close to Hungary. But again, it's um, it's really not to the point where 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 it was at once, um, and yeah, it's all part of the economic trends, isn't it? I mean, um, when um, Canterbury's Canterbury's chocolates, when they used to get their milk from British farmers, and of course the pasture in the UK had um, certain trace elements in it, so that the British were used to all the Cadbury products, but um, Kraft came in and brought Cadbury's and then Kraft basically said, well, we're going off to Romania and we're going to get the, uh, <laughs> the milk from Romania, which didn't have the pasture growth and didn't have the pH. And so uh, the taste of all the Cadbury products was, um, had gone off the Richter scale as far as the British consumers were concerned. It was a real interesting <clears throat> bean counter situation where they thought mm. they're going to be saving money, but uh, it's, a, it's the whole paradigm of commercialism, isn't it? 
Yeah, that's actually that country was it's also in my town and uh, uh, was previously was called Chibo from Chocolate oh, Bombone yeah. and then it became Kraft. And I was actually I even went to an interview to to for the IT when this was just right after I finished I graduated university before I was drafted in the army. I, I actually went for an interview to them to Kraft. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's also like another history. They were given um, some. Uh, like tax in incentives and as soon as those tax incentives finished they just moved on to a country that would give them the same incentives i think they moved somewhere else i don't know exactly. yeah yeah they do that well, the tiger economy is a major yeah. too don't yeah. They? Yeah. get a free ride yeah <laughs> yeah so. all right so um i think we've got a great grasp of that except um we're now going to move from the dance to um Dancing with the military and dancing with the White yeah. House—is that where we're going with? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sort of. Yeah. How, how did you cross the cross the uh. Atlantic? Well, yeah, I uh, this was like I moved uh, to the United States in 1999 and it uh, was uh, my ma major actually was not just general engineering, uh, but I was uh, working since university into the first Internet service provider in my town. Uh, and the, we opened the first Internet cafe. This was back in 96. Um, that's where actually I met my wife in that Internet cafe. And with that knowledge, um, I just cut the wave of dot com boom like if you remember in the 2000s every like all those dot com companies were were just exploding amazon and all those things they started to become a name uh, and they were really looking for web designers like crazy like, and i'm this was like a, really my first job after university was that i worked in a uh, architecture company where i was doing drafting uh, for like mountain chalets but also uh, because i i came from the background of it and uh, and that internet service provider i knew how to make websites and i created their website they had a bed and breakfast website besides the architecture business um, and that was my luck that was the only thing that i could actually put online and anybody in the world could actually see and um, I actually just uh, based on that, I got my first job and uh, uh, and I moved to Chicago. And um, initially I was working in a, a school teaching these kind of skills to people that were um, moving from programming. You know, it was that scare of not Y2K. I don't know if you remember yeah. for when people were saying that after when, year 2000 lots of computers will go haywire and all those programmers they were involved it was a whole army of programmers that they were involved in that but they were they felt that after that will be over they had to transition towards something else and they said okay we're going to transition to web design web development and uh, e-commerce kind of platform so this was my first job i was teaching classes in web development and i was building that company with website which was called aquarius institute of computer science in chicago um and um yeah that was pretty much it happened I just like you know how just like that i was at the right time with the right skills um and from there i just started to study more and uh, i went into from just web development into uh networking which is like just telecommunication technologies and um, I kept studying into that because Windows and all that, it was like always changing. I don't know if you remember those times when Windows 98, Windows ME, Windows 2000, it was always a perpetual change. Oh, I started with 3.1, right? Uh, point yeah, I, yeah, I started with that one back in 90, before 95. Yeah. But uh, it was still a big change during the IT industry. And I just said, okay, I'm going to go into something more fundamental that doesn't change and went into internetworking, which is the engine that drives the internet in the core. Like that, what's, that's what made the information revolution possible. Um, and uh, this was like really interesting for me. As, at the beginning, I was pretty much computers were a passion for me it was not something that i i did it for money it was back in romania it was not even paid it was we were but all my friends they were calling me and said i have this problem can you help me i was like sure i i would love to <laughs> so from that it actually ended up being my job and um, in the states i studied for pretty much many years i finished studied like probably 10 years later i started in 99 and i finished in 2009 um, and uh, I got to have two uh, expert level degrees in uh, internetworking, which is something that people that are in uh, uh, IT, it's, they know it as CCIE, it's Cisco Certified Internetwork Expert. 
which is the equivalent of a PhD in uh, uh, in the industry. So whenever you needed uh, an expert or a PhD, you had to have a CCIE on staff. And, Unless you're uh, Edward Snowden. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was actually working with the same kind of companies that Snowden was working with. I knew the company that uh, he worked for, Boas and Allen and Boas, and were working with uh, Northrop Grumman, Lockheed Martin. Uh, yeah, all these. Um, I was <clears throat> not into the defense area because I was not a born and you know yeah, with citizenship in yes. with a clearance. I was always work. I worked, always worked in the public safety. Uh, so I supported uh, things like uh, uh, Federal Emergency Management Agency and uh, state troopers and uh, medical evacuation companies. Uh, so it, the company that I worked for, it's called Airing. It's uh, Now it's actually became part of Rockwell, um, um, which was... Uh, Rockwell Collins, uh, which is a bigger con bigger company, but it was a company that had a history of 80 something years that was owning all the radio frequencies for air to ground communications. Uh, so I was, they were experts in wireless communication. And after 9-11, they realized that they have a problem in to of communication. They had all these police departments and uh, fire departments and ambulance they had all these amazing systems but they couldn't com communicate with each other so, so they, they were different frequencies. they were not different even if they had the same frequency the vendors were you know in order to bind you to their product they would cre create like a proprietary codec or a proprietary way that you couldn't buy or you couldn't interoperate with any other so vendors pretty much motorola uh, heads headphones or headsets from the police they would not work with maycom headsets that the police state police or the fire department would have so they had this problem that like say so all of a sudden oh we need to have actually a, a system that would bind all this together and um, this was the project that i worked in and their first application was actually in hurricane katrina we're creating these mobile command vehicles that i have a couple of pictures from FEMA and from that they were dispatched into these disaster areas and they were you know like where there were forest fires or hurricanes or this where they had no infrastructure so they could actually coordinate with all the first responders uh, to and all the first responders they could communicate with each other to to say oh yeah by the way I have I extinguish a fire here but I need also the person that is badly injured I need an ambulance and they didn't have time to to call their dispatcher and their dispatcher to call the other dispatcher and their dispatcher to call their <laughs> so they had to do it directly in the moments of crisis so this was my like and I worked there until 2010. And then uh, I just, during 2009, I just started to, well, one of my projects was in California and I had the surprise to discover, again, dance, because one of, in one of these outings, I, I just... Stop there for a sec. Yep. I just want to go back to Cyclone Katrina, because that was a real litmus <laughs> test um, for all those organizations. And you, and you quite rightly brought that up. But in fact, it was private enterprise, uh, none other than Walmart, that actually saved the um, New Orleans really with their infrastructure and how to um, get all their logistics and get um, all the necessary um, survival stuff into um, New Orleans and all the other um, areas where the levees broke mm -hmm. because of Cyclone Katrina. So did, did, coming back to working with all those first responders, did your system actually then tap into Walmart? Because I mean, Walmart works satellite networks and I mean, yeah. Uh, yes, we, we were. The system is amazing. Yeah, we were the back hole of the mobile command vehicle was a satellite uplink that was going to Washington DC to coordinate with the, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. So, uh, but we were like mostly like the interface between that satellite communication and the ground communication. Um, and uh, this mobile command vehicles, they were like really just big trucks with lots of antennas and and communication equipment that were was able to just pretty much uh, make this kind of this connection to uh, to, to so they could have like a coordinated uh, effort in these areas, and our uh, mobile command vehicle was de deployed in Jefferson Jefferson County, which was one of the most affected ones, and uh, some of the engineers actually had to go there to help with the effort because nobody knew how to operate this. It was brand new, um, this mobile command vehicle, and uh, that happened a couple of times. And after that, we had to. Pretty much, people started to um, 
just uh, be qualified to, to actually have the time to learn how to use it. Okay. Yeah. When you got to California, you started dance. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, like the best time of my life. I just like just realizing that all the things that I was doing back in Romania, back in 95, it was happening in the form of this ecstatic dance or initially it was uh, like we went to this uh, retreat center in North California that was doing some, what it was called what they were calling unconditional dance. So pretty much it was like a free form dance that you didn't have to learn a form. You didn't have to, you had to pretty much listen on to, to your own, uh, you know, intuition and to connect with, uh, with emotions. And um, yeah, that uh, pretty much after I spent like a year for a year, I was, I kept going there in every single vacation, every single break that I had with my, my partner, with my wife, with Monica. And we said, oh, that's it. We need to move there because I, I just felt that that's really a part that I lost from like, you know, in, the, in, the, in those more than 10 years that I was in the United States, I felt like they went in a blink of an eye. Like, you know, like everything being so busy and being doing all these things. Um, I felt like I lost something fundamental, like the joy of life. And uh, and once I got to California and I really rediscovered this uh, this form of um, rebalancing of, of this form of like really reconnecting back with what uh, with the joy inside of me, I I just changed my life completely. I, I was able to just again feel like oh life life is not just passing me by, but I can actually feel like al alive. And yeah, I can I just stop you there. Didn't mm -hmm. you say sorry? You spent some time in the White House? Were you working at the White House? Uh, yeah, this was like a, that, that time after I moved to California. I uh, Because I, I continued to do consulting for that company on the East Coast, uh, airing. Uh, but also at one point, I didn't have as many contracts. And uh, because I had, I was a double CCIE, like, a, like okay. yeah, I, I was able to, to, like the company that was teaching Cisco courses for like every, like starting from like, you know, big uh, like uh, airlines and like big uh, corporations all the way to White House. That, so this, this was called the CC Bootcamp. It's a, the company, I'm not sure if it's still around, uh, but they were the main providers. And uh, I was hired by them and, and I was flown to different locations to teach uh, these classes of so I was going to Texas, to like Nevada, to Washington. And actually, they didn't even tell me where they were. They sent me like when I actually went to teach for the White House military office. Like, yeah. <laughs> secret, secret. Yeah, they, uh, they didn't tell me. I just landed there. I just went. Uh, it was not in the White House. They rented a location that was uh, uh, it was owned by Cisco Systems. And uh, when I went into the class, usually like I would start the class and says, OK, so let's tell me like I would just go through all the students and say, tell me what you are doing for like what kind of projects you are involved. Oh and there were these very serious kind of guys. <laughs> they were like really like like I could tell that they were former military. And uh, they said, oh, yeah, most of them they were actually either former fighter pilots or this. And they were saying, yeah, no, we, now we are doing like uh, we have to deploy the wireless network for the White House. And I was like, White House? Because, like, you know, sometimes they have companies that you call them White House. I said, does it have anything to do, I was asking them, with the, the White House where President Obama? Yes, it's there. Yeah, that's, it's that's, Miami, it's <laughs> that's it. It's like, because we are the military, the White House military office, WHMO. Like, uh, and, uh, and then I looked back into my emails and then I saw all these emails with WHMO.mil. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> that's what it is. So, you got security clearance? Uh, I, no, I didn't have security clearance. I was just <laughs> pretty much I, we, I was teaching them like they were not telling me like exactly what they were doing okay. I was, it was just really generic like just teaching them like the wireless technologies that they were about to implement in the white house because nobody no consulting companies would be trusted to come in the white house uh, so they were just these guys they were doing it directly uh, you so, have to know the answer in order to give them the question because the military <laughs> won't tell you nothing <laughs> Yeah, so it it was. I was really lucky because that time I really met amazing people. Like, it was like I always was. I didn't know like where I would be sent next week, and what kind of people. And like they were from 
so such different industries and and uh, i got a glimpse of like how their life was how they're like uh you know what kind of sector they were serving what how they would find meaning into their life and and that yeah I, it was quite a gift and i i was just in awe to be to be able to do that uh, while i was there i can see how your life's been really compartmentalized when you're dealing with the military and then the communication systems and, and the fabric that you have to work with and and I interrupted you when, um, sorry about that, Julia was then bringing you across to California where you started to move into, I want to get back into my heart and learn the dance. Mm -hmm. I, I just wanted people who are watching and listen to the show to get an understanding that sometimes we just get caught up in the corporatization of, of life and and sometimes you just got to smell the roses, don't you? <laughs> Yeah. Well, if there is no, I don't know, you know, there was Churchill that was saying during the war that when they want, were about to cut the uh, funding for the Ministry of, Def of, of Culture. And I said, what do you mean? Like in the war, we have to direct all the efforts towards the military. But Churchill says, but if you cut the Mil Ministry of Culture, why are we fighting? Why? Why, why? why do we even leave? Like if we don't have that time to actually recharge, regenerate. Re so it's... For me, I felt that, yeah, that was um, sounded true. Like, uh, no matter what you do, if if that's all you do, like like just being just always like, you know, into engaged into the mainstream and um, doing what is expected of you. Yeah, you. I, I had like, I think my first house I purchased when I was 27. I had a three level house in the suburb of Chicago. Um, I had two, two and a half garage. I had three cars at one point. I don't know why I needed three cars, but I got caught into that consumerism thinking that that's the answer. But um, in spite of that, like by all standards, I was like, oh yeah, I made it. Like I just had the American dream, but I was more disappointed than ever. Like I was just really feeling that my life was drained. Like there was no substance. There was no something, not something meaningful in it um, that, that I could hang on to. And uh, all these things came at the right time, like all the all these uh, like just reviving all these things and realizing that actually they were in me, they were in my traditions, in the things that I grew up with, um, but I didn't know how to appreciate them enough when when I grew up. So you actually stepped into your emotional body once again, wasn't it? When you started dancing, you got the energy to move through your body. I mean, Julia's an exponent of that with her uh, chi gong. So she's, she's the right person to ask you these following questions. I <laughs> Yeah, I was actually yeah. going to say, you know, I, I know I've done the corporate stuff as well, and you kind of get sucked in, you know, that one you're moving from one deadline to the other and one goal to the other. <laughs> you're just jumping all these hurdles all the time. And um, there's actually a song at the moment, you know, Dance Monkey, that kind of <laughs> <laughs> alludes yeah. to that whole thing, making fun of the <laughs> generation that gets sucked into that. But um, yeah, you know, then checking out and actually listening to your body, being present and giving it the freedom to express the way it wants to without any requirements or criteria that is just such a you know it's just such a turnaround and an invite and experience for you to actually come back to your body and come back to who you are what's inside of you and what needs to be released and i think you, adrian you do a wonderful job you know you've obviously gone mm -hmm. from experiencing this as you know a recreation to dedicating your life to it and um You've gone and trained to become a facilitator in the US, right? Yeah. So you've met some teacher. Just tell us a little more about her as to why, you know, what, what was different, because there are different ways of dance schools and um, the freestyle dance, but what drew you to this practice specifically that you specialize in? Yeah, uh, well, when I was in California, as I said, I was in that um, uh, retreat center uh, when I was coming back always between teaching jobs and all this. And um, and that's where I uh, I um, met Samantha Sweetwater. She uh, she was teaching, uh, just to give, give like a couple of sample classes. And then I met her again in Burning Man, which is like a big alternative festival that happens in uh, the Nevada desert. And uh, what drew me to her, it was that, uh, like, that connection with the tradition. And, uh, like, she was, like, really, again, like, she was very embodied. She was, like, really uh, exuding so much joy. But uh, she was also, she had this wisdom, like, this kind of deep wisdom in her um, that came from, like, she had, like, teachers that were in the Native American 
practice and she took a lot of elements that were like just not just invented they were just taken from uh tangible practices that uh and she introduced us also to her teacher that was uh, george bertelstein that he he's the he was the leader of the native american church that was running all these uh, events in berkeley california that all the people from universities from hospitals that were coming to him um for to his ceremonies his pipe ceremonies uh, and uh, he would just really he was in he was a war veteran so he had his own share of trauma and from that ptsd kind of like burden uh he discovered also like uh, the native american practices and he became a pipe carrier also like through uh, a set of circumstances and uh, he was also like a, a counselor so he was uh, he had psychology background so combining the native american practices the traditional practices with what uh, like a modern psychologist would know and understand he created this amazing space that he that inspired me a lot so it just like really kind of helped me a lot to understand my own connection with those traditions my own connections with what is happening uh in uh, in my body and uh, and then i started to make these connections that because i traveled through so many places to see the commonalities like to see actually what is the reason why those things are done because you know even each tradition has different ways of doing some people they have different beliefs or myths around it uh, but you see all those myths are different because it depends on the environment like the andes they have a different traditions than the native americans or the europeans but they all have something common and that commonality it was like those techniques to really get into your body and be able to remind your body how to unwind and slide down into that state what i call relaxed awareness yeah, or trance yeah. and uh, those were techniques that are very simple techniques that you can like anybody can learn but the only secret is like you have to practice them you have to you know it, it's not something that you do once and you're just all set you have to be making it part of to why re rewire your nervous system so you can relax again uh, and this is a process but it's something that is done in a pleasant way you know because many people they want to do all kinds of things they want to go to the gym they want to do like you know have a healthy body but you know they drag their feet to the gym or they drag their feet to do something that it doesn't flow with their life whereas dance it's something that in the traditional community was a part integral part of their life it, and it was something that you didn't have to force yourself to go and it was fulfilling all these needs of physical exercise of of connecting with yourself of of meditation like being bringing yourself back into peace of um yeah just and socializing which is like again one of the most important elements in in dance so I all think that's sort of work yeah yeah so i'll just adrian i'll just highlight what you're saying because i think for you know, even for me, that's new. I hadn't realized that the dance practices that you do, and as you said, you come full circle because your grandfather, that was your great grandfathers were using the dance, dance on weekends to help people get over PTSD. And then you've gone to America and you've ended up <laughs> you know, learning the same thing, but you know, from from different um, different indigenous tribes and practices, and and then putting it together and. Um, as a hypnotherapist, I have looked at PTSD, and um, I think World War One. You know, there's a lot of footage of soldiers coming back from the war, and they can't actually move. They're stumbling because their muscles, everything's mm -hmm. just packed. It's just like it's just so tight, so tight that there's actually footage of them that they can't move. And then after mm -hmm. they've gone into trance and they've started releasing, you know, whatever's frozen from their system and also the spirits, you actually see footage of people moving normally again and um you know as you were saying that i was just remembering that and um realizing that in your own way that's also what you know is something that you're passionate about knowing that that is what that kind of dancing can actually do for people yeah our goat can play a huge part kind of goat and recriminations and what other people think of you it's, and, and if, particularly if you're going and killed someone and you've gone to war and actually killed another human being it's not part of your psyche and of course that must have a real major effect on people isn't it? yeah yeah i don't think anybody that goes through a war experience can come out like 
hole on the other side or the other side and uh, but many times it's like these are extreme cases but many times it's like just it's not only always like ptsd it could be like even things like for instance going through a traumatic experience of disconnection like for instance of going through a breakup or going through like uh, like like a childhood that uh, like some experiences that probably like feeling disconnected from the parents the primary carers all those things they leave scars onto into our psyche and uh, um and what our subconscious does it does this kind of bulk sorting and usually it's done in the sleep because if we don't give ourselves time to meditate or do some kind of practice of like walking or, or like, you know, gardening or something that will disconnect our mind, uh, but still keeping uh, focus. Uh, usually this kind of traumatic experiences, they get sorted in the dream. it's like really connecting with others having meaningful relationships and and uh, losing that completely like as a result of a trauma that of an event that probably sometimes many times it happened just once but f leaves a scar in our soul that some in the traditional cultures they, they say we lose part of our soul and then they do this trans uh, inductions and this kind of shamanic ceremonies to bring pa that part of our soul back in, in other words, in modern terms, it's nothing else but really releasing that trauma that was uh, that marked as like a big part of life uh, as unsafe, releasing, re raising that shield and letting ourselves to live again. So that's like really probably like more common uh, than uh, nowadays than the PTSD of like some uh, somebody that comes from a war. And but that's the part that actually takes really a big toll. On, on many people that I've I've seen just really just going through like mundane uh, you know uh, experiences and then all of a sudden they realize that all of a sudden I'm not I feel like I'm numb inside I don't really feel alive anymore and it's just really many times it's tracing back to an event like this uh, of some kind of thing that without even knowing started to affect our daily life because all these things kind of get programmed and and they happen uh, be, below our awareness they happen unconsciously and it's a mixture of like again childhood memories or experiences sometimes teenage dreams or like nowadays it's like a mixture of like probably commercials and social media of all kinds of things that we think that it's important and all of a sudden we feel hurt that we are not really um, like up to good enough or we are not lovable. I think, Jeff, we, I was talking about this thing with you before about how media influences us and uh, how like really the whole model of uh, news is like uh, excitement for free news. You just give us, you give, give us your attention and we'll give you free news. But all those uh, news are really not reality they are just extremes are just either like things that are happening like really once in a while or or things that are very bad and and really that kind of leaves people that live a normal life to feel inappropriate like really feel that they are out of place and um and all these things are just having an impact on us and what with the dances and this is like really you can actually reconnect with people that leave this experience and realizing that actually it's not just you that have this kind of feeling of being inappropriate or like being not good enough that actually many people go through that challenge and that's what makes it more more i don't know how to say easier to overcome easier to actually tackle that problem so it's we start always with like a sharing circle which we just don't we don't say oh yeah just pour your life here but just a little bit about what kind of challenges you have generic and then realizing that actually the challenge that you thought that it was just you it was probably like 10 other people they have it 
and then you have the chance to connect and and really relate with those people and and really learn from each other how because some people they were able to overcome some up some uh, uh, challenges some people they are still in the process of doing it so it's all about this collective um, power that we have when we come as together as a collective uh, that gets unleashed into into these uh, community gatherings uh, and this is actually our superpower as humans like there is this book uh, I don't know if you've heard of it it's like it's called Sapiens by uh, Yuval uh, Noah Harari it's, it's called the brief history of humanity and he said that we as humans we are not really strong super strong physically we don't have like amazing senses of like smell or hearing or sight any animal just like a dog can have smell a hundred times better than us uh, any kind of animal it's stronger than us uh, and uh, in spite of that we are the dominant species on this planet and this is just because we have this quality we have the ability to share knowledge we have the ability to to collaborate on a larger scale that that no other animal can do like even apes and like other social animals they can do it but on a very limited kind of like a scale like for instance apes they do it like just for the people with the people in their tribe like people that they know but they cannot really collaborate to the level to create like so to actually build up the technology that will build a car for instance they, they are just in case because they cannot really scale up that much so he said, Yuval Harari was saying that our capacity to actually connect with the same purpose and, and collaborate even with strangers, uh, it's, it's our superpower. And uh, if there would be any kind of future for humanity, it's just if we actually re reconnect back together with each other and we, we tap into what actually made us get to where we are, but in, in, a, in a more sustainable and, and better way. So tell us about, um, you know, you obviously you, you, you and your wife uh, do these we, uh, weekly events where people can do, find exactly that. They can come in and connect and dance and mm -hmm. express themselves in a way that normally they can't in everyday life. Um, if people would like to join in, what, what, where do they come? What's the best way for them to find out more? Uh, just if you're in Brisbane, just Google Ecstatic Dance Brisbane or go to ecstaticdance.com.au. Uh, there we have like our schedule for our weekly events. Uh, so I, I wanted to make them weekly events because this is, uh, as I said, it's a practice. It's not something that you do once in a while, like entertainment or, or this, because it has to do with getting your your nervous system rewired to paint a different emotional picture. You need, you don't go, you know, you don't get good at gym at the gym just going once to the gym or you don't get good at anything in like just or any kind of mental skill or any other skill by doing it just once and uh, this is no different it really takes practice and um i really i just for the last eight years we were able to to just dedicate every week time to actually do this event um and um, now, actually, more than ever, after we had this period of uh, isolation in, co in COVID and this, we actually found that even for many years, we were like just not really, just not many people were coming, were probably like having like small um, like uh, events. Nowadays, I think mo many people, they just realize that this is a really important part of their life. I think many times we appreciate only something that we take for granted, granted only when we lose it. And we, when we lost this kind of cohesion and this kind of places to actually connect, people, I think they realize that, you know, th these kind of events are actually providing that. And this is what we aim to, to create a space where people feel comfortable and feel at ease to, to actually communicate and, and be able to form uh, meaningful connections. And not least, just to be able to learn how to, unwind their attention to release all the stress that they accumulate during the week and uh, and step into the weekend as better persons for to be present with their family with their loved ones yeah. and we have yeah, yeah. sorry and having been to the dance events and they're both daytime and evening you have certainly succeeded in doing that both a safe space and a open space where the people are really respectful of each other and where it really doesn't matter what age or uh, color or shape mm. you are, um, you just feel 
you just feel like natural and accepted and like you have the freedom to um, not be a zombie <laughs> or a <laughs> robot. And instead of, you know, really express yourself so well done you, Adrian. Oh, thank you, Julia. Yeah, yeah, did that's... you have any questions before we sign off? Um, I was interested to hear about the uh, use of meditation and so forth. Um, yeah, for a, a mere male to step into his emotional body, I'll tell you what, um, that's what I've been doing for the last seven or eight weeks. And I have to say, it's really painful. It's really, really hard. And um, I know in my meditation states, I've actually seen myself come to these huge, big French doors, you know, the wooden doors, and I open them. And then just as I open, I just get hit with all this bloody energy and it's just overwhelming. It's just so much just hits you. And so I shut them doors. <clears throat> and, um, you say you, you put your suit of armor on, <laughs> put your buddy, get in your castle, and <laughs> you've got all your other fellow warriors with you, and you've got your moat, and you've got your drawbridge. So, you know, up come the walls, you know. So, um, but you know, in these last seven weeks, so I've, I've made this monumental decision to um, get get out of the suit of armor and get out of that castle and get out of that, get, open the drawbridge and go out onto the land. And a bit like that movie um, avatar which reached you know so many people psychically i suppose it was such a it just touched people the way that you can walk on the land and get touched with the with the earth and so forth and um and it feels like i've now come back to those french doors and opened it up and i've just taken this humongous big energy whack that's just flooded my body and it's just so painful i tell you it's it's worse worse than you could actually ever imagine and you're just going in and you're looking at ways where you can transmute that in, in any form you can and I mean I remember sitting down and I've, I've expressed myself in no uncertain terms <laughs> to, to, to whoever's listening out there and I'm saying who would want to come to this bloody planet you know you talk about love and all that stuff but there's no such thing as bloody love and when you do go and find the love and you climb the highest mountain and you can feel it all of a sudden there's the Duplicity of, of the opposite, where you, you go right down to the, to the swings of the opposite, where you feel recriminations, you feel the guilt, all the stuff's coming up. It's bloody really painful, but I've been listening to you and realizing how important dance seems to be in movement. And, and Julia's here with the Qigong. I mean, it's about going into that, stepping into that emotional body. That, um, and I'd have to say, Western males, and I'd be probably per se one of the Western males that doesn't want to get involved in that emotional body and, and as a result with such mental <laughs> can't hypnotize this is how we're going to do it step back and, and we, we we're not we're all like mr spock you know like you know look so logical and yet stepping into that that feminine essence that females have you know with um, the nurturing aspects and feeling and expressing and uh, it's it's a goddamn uh, situation that any male who wants to go through that journey, it's a really an interesting journey and needs people like you, Adrian, who can actually take them through that, that journey of dance and rhythm and, and just expressing themselves. And, and for males, you know, who've been told, you know, you've got to toughen up and you can't cry and, you know, you've got to be a man and all that stuff to be able to witness a culture that you've expressed um, in terms of the, the dance movement. I think you're leading um i think you're the leader of of males it's just a matter of whether males would respond to stepping out of their suit of armor you know and coming in through the doors to feel that they can have a go and, and not be ashamed of having a go i, I, I take my hat off bloody brilliant mate. and you can show as we've been listening to your show how you've gone through from romania and through the communist world and then you got into the internet and then you've gone into all the internet stuff and then you went to the states and you've been teaching and then you got into the military and you got into this corporization and then you started saying hello there's another way of life there's another way of looking at life and, and i think you coming on tonight um and for those people witnessing to it uh i take me out off to you mate you know fantastic 
Oh, thank you for what you are also doing because putting this show together and making this possible to to address so many people and uh, really that's the communication that's what i was thinking i was saying before like just bringing people together and you are doing that we are pretty much bringing uh, people to with this message together and like with all the other podcasts and uh, uh, and uh, events that you do it's it's really addressing that part that it's missing so much into into our just mainstream uh, media and uh, thank you thank you for that and thank you for you know inviting me and, and giving me the chance to to be able to to share this with you okay so they've got to go to the facebook site or the website to find out where you're um where you're facilitating is it all on the north side or the south side of brisbane where you go on the sunshine coast you go to um, the Gold coast no we have just uh, i just wanted to just focus on on our, our community here in brisbane uh, occasionally we go to some other places but uh, it's just an exception rather than the rule so the rule is like to really provide that space weekly and we have a space now that in um, uh, ashgrove uh, it's called the new market hall um, and uh, that's where all the events will be from next month this month we still have a couple of events in west end uh it, it's a uh, like intersection between uh, vulture street and boundary street it's uh, a church and behind that church is a hall that's why we had our events for the last more than seven and a half years and, and but we we started in parallel to offer uh, like uh, these other events in the weekend in ashgrove and um yeah it's a much better space it's uh, like a space where th there is nature around and people before the dance after the dance can go outside and you know lay on the grass watch the stars you know feel uh, like you know have a, have more of a natural environment than uh, you know even if it's in the middle of the city it feels like you are somewhere out out in the uh, in nature and uh, it's happening every week, once a week, one week it's Friday, uh, after people after work, they come from 7 p.m. And uh, then the following week, it's on Saturday and it starts from uh, 5.30 uh, and we go all the way to nine o'clock. And uh, it's really a whole process, uh, just really, the, the only thing is just to give yourself the chance to try it because you never know. Um, what what it is it's very hard to explain because it's a again it's an experience it's not something that um you have to participate in it to to get the taste of it and that's saturdays or is it just like saturdays yeah say it again they're all saturdays are they uh, saturdays and fridays so it's alternating between fridays and saturdays uh it's just the only time the only thing difference is the time on friday 7 p.m uh so just to to be uh suitable for people that work and they come from work and they after a week of stressful you know things just come back just to have a dance before the weekend and then saturday and saturday usually we have bigger events um, and those we start at 5 30 and that's when we have also the cacao ceremonies um, which are just again like another element that you, we add to the to the dance to uh, that helps in uh, connecting with the cacao it's really a gentle medicine it's not really the chocolate that you get from the from the store it's a it's a it's a raw uh, unprocessed uh, cacao that we we get from south america and we make this uh, elixir that we that that actually helps the body first all the blood vessels dilate um, and you get into a state of relaxation that help you step into that state of relaxed awareness um, again, you are always in control. It's just a matter of like really having a, a help from the outside. Whenever if you feel a bit too tight, cacao. It's again, it, it's a it's a medicine that helps in uh, in relaxing the body and drop into that state where you can actually be danced, not just dance. Because you know, dance many times we are taught that we should perform, do something. Uh, the re the dance that um, it's like usually from the traditional cultures it's a dance that kind of comes from the inside it's an expression of who you are um, and it comes naturally when your body is relaxed and and we have a couple of exercises that we offer as a sample to try uh, again all the things that are we do there they are completely optional but it's like really something that we learn that from different cultures that are helping in unwinding the body they are 
breathing techniques, they are tapping, they are shaking, they are all different movements that kind of um, remind the body to do what it does naturally because the body has its own intelligence. Uh, it, it knows how to get back into uh, into harmony, but we hold back. It's like, and this is, uh, there are exercises that are kind of helping in reminding the body to do what it does naturally. And uh, once it does that, then magic happens, like really kind of the, that state of ecstasy, that state of trance, the way where you just can feel completely immersed and your your whole body feels fluid. And and yeah, I, I my joy is like really to see that uh, in a whole, like be able to share this uh, this experience with uh, with so many people every week is just priceless, and so it's what makes me really just <laughs> get up every day. And it is wonderful, and um, you know, I've been a couple times, and often I see the same people, and uh, with Adrian and Monica, and the music's just awesome. So, thank you very much for coming onto the show, Adrian. Thank you, dear listeners, for joining us, and uh, we hope you have a great week. And next week we will actually have um, one of the, I think it's the great grandson of Khalil Gibran joining us from Hawaii. So the time will be a bit earlier; it'll be four o'clock. To- accommodate for the time difference but thank you for joining us today and tune in again next week have a great week in between thank you from all of us thank you thank you